Elton John. The name around the world now is just muck. like an institution. Yes, muck. No, it's yeah, not no, muck. But, yes, well. Uh, you've just played me the new album, and we'll get on to that later into this interview, but going right back to when you first started playing piano, what were your real ambitions at that stage? When you first started Well, I started playing, playing piano when I was like three or four, so I didn't really have any ambitions at that time. Only probably to be sort of like, maybe not to wet my nappy. But, um, <laughs> no, when you're three and four, you don't have any ambitions. No, I no. just really enjoyed playing the piano. I mean, Winifred Atwood was my idol, as you know. And I just played by ear, and, and my ambition started more or less when I first heard rock and roll with Jerry Lewis and Little Richard and Fats Domino. Those piano players influenced me so much. And I, all I knew is I wanted to be in, uh, involved with music, I mean, no matter if it was playing with it or selling records or whatever. But I knew after I heard those three guys play that, uh, that I just wanted to be involved in music. My auntie Wynne played the piano. Right. And my parents also collected records every week, so they bought two or three uh, 78s every week. So I really grew up... It really dates me, but on uh, K-Star and Frankie Lane and, and Nat King Cole. Uh, great records, actually. Uh, so there was always music in the house. And I remember my grandmother putting me on her knee and then collapsing because of the weight. And, and I, about three, I, I just used to sort of like play to Winifred Atwell records. And I just, if you, got, if you got a gift for the ear, and uh, played by ear, and then I had to learn, you know, and the parents sent me to music school, which was a real drag. But actually it helped me in the end. But it was, I just enjoyed playing by ear. Uh, and the, when I went to the Royal Academy for five years, uh, that, was, that was nice, but at the time I, started, I wasn't really into classical music at all. But in hindsight, it really helped me a lot as far as structure of songs, chords, etc. Et mm. But um, I just loved playing the piano. I could only play in one key, though, so that the Academy did teach me to play in more than one key. I only played in C before I went to the Academy. Okay, uh, so, so then <laughs> you listen to rock and roll. Yes. Um, you want then to be part of that? Well, I didn't really know what I wanted to be because I mean I wasn't exactly the, the, a rock and roll looking person. I was sort of like Billy Bunter goes for frantic, you know. Um, that was what it was. I used to mime to Jerry Lee Lewis records and things like that. I just enjoyed. I loved. You know, I'd never heard a piano play like that before. I mean, those guys, Jerry Lewis, Richard and Vance Domino, play piano like nobody's ever heard before. And then there's been obviously other people that have influenced me since, like Leon Russell and. Anna Toussaint and people like that, but those three guys, I mean, I'd never heard piano play like that. Mm. And so, and I used to sort of like, I went to see them live and everything, and I used to just like copy them and, and play at parties, how embarrassing. I was, I was the family fe uh, sort of feature, and I'll oh, bring Reg along, so you you know, play the piano for half an hour, and I used to stand up and be horrible in my sort of like smart clothes and sing a whole lot of shaking going on and things like that. I was a meek child, sort of pent up, and had lots of hang ups, you know. I never say boo to a goose. And when I look back on my career, I left the bluesology. Uh, I'm actually backing Long John Baldry. Mm. And the reason I left because I was in a band that played to cabaret, like people who like fish and chips, and that's the dearth for a musician. There's so many good musicians around playing in bars, playing in pubs, playing in dance bands that have to earn a wage, but they're playing to people that are not interested in their music. It's very sad. And I wouldn't, at that stage, I, I said, I'm not going to do this because I knew I could earn a living somehow by playing the piano. And I'm quite proud of the fact that at that early age, when I was very meek and mild, then I thought, I'm not going to play to people that don't want to, you know, are not interested. So, again, you create your own luck, and through that, I, I answered this ad in the, in the News Express and got together with Bernie. So, I'm a great believer in you create your own luck and making brave decisions. And looking back on it, my personality, that was a brave decision for me to make. All right, so I mean, like, you have, uh, I mean, many, uh, many musicians uh, backing different artists, be, you know, like a keyboard player, a bass player, a guitar player. And as you say, I mean, like, you're with Long John Baldry. Uh, when you and Bernie got together, was the idea then that you were going to be a solo artist? No, I mean, I, the last thing I wanted to do after I left Rizology was go on the road. I mean, I, I didn't sing anyway. Mm -hmm. I was a hopeless organ player. And all I wanted to do, the only thing I could think of maybe doing was to write songs and for other people. And Bernie and I were always hopeless at writing songs for other people. In fact, I've never written a song ever in my life that's been a hit by anybody else. Bernie has now, without me, written the Jefferson Starship and the Heart record. Yeah. And been, but I've never actually written a hit for anybody else at all. So I was always, when I was always been accused of being commercial, I was thought, well, come on guys, you know. I've actually sat down and tried to write hits for people and they've been, you know, absolutely useless. And we were writing those sort of songs for like Silla Black and Tom Jones, and also writing the other songs that we liked as well, um, the early songs, like even Preempty Sky. 
And suddenly Steve Brown appeared at Dick James Music and heard the songs that we were writing and we liked and went to Dick James and said, listen, you must give these guys a chance. Forget the commercial song, let them write that, you know. And that's how it all started. And because no one covered the songs, I had to sing the songs. And I gradually, it's, it's, it happened gradually. On my own, as Elton John, the first uh, effort on vinyl was called I've Been Loving You, which was credited as being Elton John Bernie Torpin. It was actually Elton John, you can tell, all Elton John mm. lyrics. It was just horrendous. Um, and it's a collector's item. But the Lady Samantha was the first, I count, the first Elton John record. That was Steve Brown producing. and. I didn't think Lady Samantha was you know, that great, but it got us a lot of airplay. I always remember the session, I played an electric piano and the, the song was written in B flat and the central B flat on the electric piano was completely out of tune. So it was, in those days you couldn't complain, you just had you know, three hours to do a song. And Lady Samantha was the first sort of song that got us noticed on the radio anyway. And to get noticed in those days you had to start doing gigs, form a band, the whole process that I didn't want to do. Um, and in the end, enjoyed getting it together. I never thought of myself as a performer or a singer. I was just like a backing musician. Or I just wanted the easy life writing songs. I got Nigel Olsen and Dee Murray in the band, who nobody really around me rated very much and didn't particularly want them in the band. Especially Nigel, there's a lot of anti-Nigel Olsen feeling, which I, in fact, I mean, if you look at it, Nigel and Dee only played on uh, one track before Honky Chateau, and that was Anne Marina on Tumbleweed Connection. And long after that we were playing on the road, even mm. on, to Madman Across the Water, when we were a, a successful band, Gus didn't have them on the record. Then he played on one track on my albums up to Honky Shutter. So we just clicked. It was something like the Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix had like Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell, and it, the three of them clicked, and the three of us clicked. And there was no other band going around with just piano, bass and drums. And mm. I enjoyed it. I mean, the actual doing, doing the gigs, and I didn't think I would, but I actually did enjoy it a lot. OK. Um you get to, um, which is like the end of 1970, and the self-titled album comes out. We were the darling of the FM, of, of radio in England, but it actually didn't sell in England. It sold first in America, um, and then sold in England. Um, we put, I mean, we had so much airplay. Mm. The album came in at 45 in England and went straight out again. But it happened in America first, and then it rebounded and started selling all around the world. Um, it was all so quick. I mean, the, the Troubadour thing was so quick. I mean, I became more as a star overnight because of one review in a newspaper. And it was, I'm grateful that I did, that it happened that way because I didn't have time to think about it. I enjoyed it so much. Everything I, you know, I became someone that I sort of like, I, I idolized as a kid. I mean, I never thought of myself as a pop star. I remember sitting in my publisher's office in New York when my album was 17 with a bullet in cash box and seeing Deja Vu 18. And I queued up to buy Deja Vu by Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young. And I got a telegram that same day from George Harrison. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. And I'm, it, we enjoyed it so much and we were very disciplined in our work. Uh, and because we loved it and we, we enjoyed it, we put out an immense amount of product from 70 to 76, mm -hmm. not only albums, but separate singles. And it was just because we absolutely couldn't believe our luck and we just loved every minute of it.